So my plan is to talk a little bit about uh, 12. It'll actually be quite a few more than 12 hikes for fall and winter, and also including some, some opportunities to drive. So there may be some drives in there. And if you happen to be so fortunate as to have a copy of Hiking Humboldt Volume 2, I will be referring to a number of number of hikes that are included in that volume. So take notes, take notes on the book. Um, if you have questions, we'll try to get to those as we go. And thank you again for being part of this. One of the realities, at least for a few more days, looks like there's rain in the forecast for later this week, but I doubt that it will be enough to really alter the fire situation. The reality is, and this was taken just a couple of days ago at Arcata Marsh for a rosy sunset, the Slater fire north of us is uh, still is over 150,000 acres and Red Salmon fire is 120,000 plus acres and the August complex fire is a million acres, inconceivable. So pushing that's pushing north to Ruth Lake and threatening Bell Springs Road and Fort Seward, Alder Point and Blocksburg. And so the reality is between fires and, and COVID, um, there are some real restrictions on what we'll be able to do in the coming months. But rains will come. Rains will come. The average rainfall at Woodley Island is 40 inches annually. As you uh, can see, we really have a rainy season and a dry season. Between November and March, 80% of our, of our rain falls. And we're coming to the end, hopefully soon, of the, of the dry season. So I'm going to focus on walks that are generally less impacted by wet conditions. So that means often uh, road walks. There are over 1,300 miles of public roads in Humboldt County, so I'm going to highlight some of the ones I consider to be better, of some of the better of those. I'm going to avoid talking about inland high country walking because we do have snow as an issue. And uh, we have 110 miles of coastline in Humboldt County, although in the winter, and uh, late fall, it's important to be aware of, it's always important to be aware of tide and wave conditions, but particularly aware of tide and wave conditions as the storm surges become more aggressive. And it's, uh, it's, it's a reality that we're facing still, the, the COVID-19. So I want to cover just briefly the issues around social distancing and what I recommend and uh, what we continue to learn about as we go on learning more and more about COVID-19. Masks are good, even if you're walking. Um, avoiding contact for extended periods of time, and particularly if you're riding to and from a, a walk, um, I really think unless you're riding with somebody in, inside your bubble, there's just no way to be safe in a shared car. So as much as I'm an advocate of car, carpooling, I think we have to wait until they're safer times. Smaller groups are better, uh, especially if you can uh, do anything to minimize your exposure. So again, I'm going to be focusing on road walks, beach walks, where you can socially distance. I'm going to limit my uh, uh, the emphasis on single track trails, although I have included some, um, because winter is not a time you're going to encounter nearly as many people. and and don't share food or drink. I know with the volunteer trail stewards, we have um, shifted now so that we provide only prepackaged food as a, as a uh, food source, snack source for folks. So I think that's also one of the realities. So many of you may know John Palmquist. I don't even know if he may be on. Um, I love this picture, especially for an Ollie presentation. I'm not going to talk about some of the old standard faithful hikes, the Hikshari, the Bay Trail North, the Hammond Trail, Patrick's Point, Trinidad Head. I think those you already know, and there's no need to sort of spend time on those. I'm going to talk about others outside of those that may not be as uh, well, well known by everyone. Um, 
I have included one element of the Bay Trail, and that's the Waterfront Trail North, which I'll talk about a little later. So let's start with number 12. So this is a walk that also works well as a drive. It's about a 60 mile loop from the courthouse in Eureka up over Neeland and down Butler Valley Road, which is also a good ro walk, road walk, which I'll talk about in a moment. Maple Creek around through Corbell, Blue Lake and around. One of the advantages of this walk in the fall is that Maple Creek truly does have a number of big leaf maples, which is uh, one of the few deciduous trees that really shows well. It's a nice yellow tree uh, in this area. And the uh, Fortuna Senior Hiking Group often will walk the stretch from the Mad River crossing around Maple Creek north along the road. It's a road walk and you can go uh, an easy and relatively flat three miles or so out and back along that road. I'll show a few pictures in a moment. Or if you want, it's all downhill or all uphill is the Butler Valley Road. Again, and not a heavily trafficked road, um, especially in the in the winter and the in the fall. Um, the Fort, Fortuna Senior Hiking Group does it in a way where they often do a shuttle. It's a little tougher in COVID times, but um, something to consider if you have a have a bubble group in your bubble that you could could facilitate that with. Um, here are some pictures. This is a wintertime picture of Maple Creek itself and shows you a little bit of the color that you can see along uh, the Maple Creek Butler Valley roads. Really is a pretty spectacular area and well well worth the extra effort that it takes to uh, to make that that long drive and maybe include a walk. Okay, number 11, 11-ish. Many of you probably know Russ Park, but in many ways, I think it's one of the underappreciated local resources. It's hike number 56 in Hiking Humboldt volume two. And uh, uh, one of the things I like to do when I take this walk, because it's about a two and a half mile loop, it's not a flat walk. It's a pretty uh, uh, steep uphill walk, uh, uphill and downhill. It's not uh, maintained by anything beyond volunteers. So it can or cannot be in, and uh, there can be some condition issues. But when I was most recently on it, and I guess I've heard through the summer that conditions are pretty good right now. Um, early in the winter after we've had a storm, there are often trees down along the, the, this route. It was donated in 1920 by a, a member of the Russ family, Zipporah Rush, Russ, and uh, she, in the process, uh, had a pond named in her honor, uh, partway up the, the trail. I don't know if you can see the, this is the parking area that's used. I'm gonna use my cursor to, to show that which is off of Bluff Street, which is just a little bit east of Ferndale. And each one of these pictures, I've tried to show roughly where on the trail you can have a view somewhat like this. I apologize for the orientation of this map. If you take special care, you've noticed that I have north faced to the, to the left side of the screen. Um, so it's a little bit disorienting in the way I've done this, but couldn't figure out a different way to do it. Um, in addition to the, the forest pond, it has these big magnificent Sitka spruce throughout the, the park. And then it has some amazing and wonderful, delightful views out over Ferndale. So it's a, it's a two and a half mile walk. Um, it's pretty good just about any, any time of the year. So I always, can't help myself, especially for fall and winter hikes, to include urban walks. And both Arcata, Eureka, Fortuna, Ferndale all have wonderful urban walks. Part of it is a combination of historical walks, architectural walks, 
even some other surprises. So this particular map shows the Arcata Walk that is in your book, if you have Hiking Humboldt, Volume 2. Um, it's also available through arcadahistory.org. It's an online resource that has three tours that you can do in Arcata that are well described. And this sort of combines a, a combination of most of those three tours. Um, it includes a lot of things that you might not expect. Everything from uh, a shotgun house here on 7th Street. A shotgun house, for example, is a house where in theory you open the front door and you open the back door and if you shot a gun through the middle, it would go right out, the bullet would go right out the back door. Every room is sequentially uh, in order and there's a pathway, pathway right through the middle. Um, just to the east of the shotgun house here on 7th Street is a cork tree. So um, you never know what you're gonna see in, in these kind of walks. In addition, there's some wonderful um, variety of different Victorian architecture on display. In Arcata, the Bear House is a good example. In fact, there are eight sites on the National Historic Register in Arcata. There are actually 19 in Eureka. Ferndale has seven and, and even Fortuna has several. So there's lots of, of, of interesting architectural opportunities to, well to sort of visit and appreciate this area. Um, there are murals in Eureka that are, are worth adding into the mix. And um, I, I would say that it's also an opportunity to combine a little food and drink with a walk. This is uh, the Ferndale Walk. Um, the Ferndale Walk is, is just about two and a half miles. If you're ambitious after you've done Russ Park, you can go walk some of the uh, Ferndale Walk. But it includes a lot of the uh, of wonderful um, Victorian building structures like the Gingerbread Mansion and uh, the Victorian Inn. And then up, up uh, right below Russ Park, to the west of Russ Park, which is at the upper part of the, uh, I realize I'm pointing at the picture and you can't see that. The cursor would show this is where Russ Park begins um, at the uh, upper side of, of Ferndale Cemetery. So hike number 10, really three, three or four hikes in one is really think about an urban walk. Uh, I, I need to say as a disclaimer that these are sidewalk walks, uh, road walks, so you have to take special care for traffic keep an eye on that, but um, it, it's good year round. Another one that I can't help but include every time, I'll talk a little bit more broadly about the Samoa Peninsula, but I want to include my favorite walk, one of my all-time favorites in Humboldt County. It's a five-mile walk. You don't have to do all of it, but it's the um, Malel, I'll show it in a little more detail, but it, this picture itself, as you may have recognized, is Mad River Slough. And uh, it's featured on part of this walk. And here it's at high tide. Doesn't always look quite this, uh, this dramatic. But this walk really begins at the Nature Center, the Friends of the Dunes structure on Stamps Road. And I like to take the Wildberries Trail out to the ocean. And uh, from the ocean, you, you go north along the, uh, the beach. So you have to pay somewhat attention to the tide levels and, uh, and wave conditions. And then you go inland into Malel North. Uh, and I might note that Malel North is one of the places that I've talk, talked about so far that is not allow, does not allow dogs. So Malel South allows dogs, the Nature Center, Friends of the Dunes allows dogs, uh, the Manila Community Center allows dogs, but Malel North does not. Um, once you reach the uh, Malel North, you come over the high dunes, and I'm gonna show a picture of that in a moment, and you come back along the trail that goes along Mad River Slough, and you follow it, it's the old Hammond Railroad line, it's very flat, it's a gravel road 
The road into this parking area, Mullel North, is open Friday through Monday. It's not open Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. But it's open to walkers. You can walk, this is fenced off. You can walk this stretch all the way out to Mullel South uh, without worrying about car traffic. What I do at Mullel South is that I head back towards the ocean and I take the waterline trail back to the Wildberries Trail and go back to the Nature Center. Now, all that being said, it's not terribly well signed. So you need to go out there, at least prepared for the first time or two to, to get lost a little bit um, and make sure that you take the extra time to go up onto one of the foreshore dunes and sort of find your, your position. You'll be able to tell in a great deal by the high dunes where you have the high clear dunes, you know that you've started to reach Malel North. I'll show a picture of that. There are restrooms at a number of locations along here, including the Nature Center, Malel North and Malel South and at the Manila Community Center. While I'm at it, rather than come back to it, well, maybe I'll come back to it. This is a picture of the high dunes. Doesn't quite do it justice. It's one of my favorite spots in the county because it seems so different than just about every place else in the county. Here we are looking like we're in the Sierra or look like, looking like we're in Namibia with the ocean out there and these high, high dunes with the, uh, the beach pine forest on the east side of these dunes and, and the slough and these wonderful pictures. You get a better sense. Here's the beach pine forest and the, and the Mad River slough. So it's really a, a wonderful multifaceted walk. Okay, I'm going to go back for a second. The other option, which is shorter, it's, uh, it's uh, probably more in the two and a half mile option, is to go out again on the Wildberries Trail and go instead of north, you're going to go southwest, south southwest, down for a, about a mile or so to the entrance, the trail entrance, the Beach P Trail, up to Manila Community Center. And you can retrace your steps if you wish. I, I personally like to go across 255 and go back along 255 till you cut across 255 again to get to Stamps Road. <coughs> Excuse me. One other thing that's happening that's underway is Caltrans is working on a half mile long trail that will make it unnecessary. I'm going to take another drink. <clears throat> Caltrans is working. Excuse me. I'll take a moment. <clears throat> it's not COVID. Um, <clears throat> Caltrans is working at, on a new half mile long trail that will go along the north side of 255 between the community center and almost to the nature center. One of the things I really like about the Samoa Peninsula is how much history there is involved there. The, those of you that have not seen this picture before, this is a picture of the town of Samoa. Back, if you can identify, before 255 went in. So there's no 255 going along the west side of Samoa, the north side of Samoa. Most of these structures outside of the town of Samoa, good, I've got my voice back. Most of these buildings that are all down with the exception of a few including the Samoa cookhouse over here on the, on the right side of the photo. Um, the Hammond Mill, just a little bit of the history of this area because there are additional interesting walks uh, included in Hiking Humboldt and it's a good place to go wander. Um, but the reality of this area is it's just so rich with history. Initially in 1892, uh, the Vance Holdings that were in Eureka, they had a big fire, they burned, they relocated over to the peninsula. And then about eight years later, 
they were purchased by the Hammond Lumber Company, which operated operated the uh, Samoa Mill for uh, the next 56 years. It was sold to Georgia Pacific in 1956. Um, when Samoa was initially developed, which was actually in 1889, before, before the uh, Vance Company moved over there, the developers thought, well, we're gonna name this Samoa because in 1889, there was conflict brewing between Germany, Britain and the US over the Samoan island chain, which generated a great deal of patriotic fervor. And so the de developers thought they could cash in on that name to help them sell lots. Well, I think in the end, the Hammond company bailed them out of a difficult situation. Um, I might mention too that during this time period, this is when boats like the Madiket uh, regularly went across and provided the ferry service from Eureka over and brought workers back and forth to work at the Hammond Mill. Anyway, lots of wonderful walks and reasons to explore the Samoa Peninsula, especially during winter when a lot of other options aren't available. All right, Redwoods. There are many good options for redwood walking. Now, I'm not really gonna talk that much about uh, Arcata Community Forest, but uh, it's not a bad place. Uh, Sequoia Park has done some trail improvement recently and uh, I think has become a, has a better little loop trail in there. Um, I'm not gonna talk as much about some of the Red, Humboldt Redwoods walks and some of those in Redwood National Park and State Parks where the summer bridges have been removed. And a lot of the ones, especially down in Humboldt Redwoods, rely on summer bridges for part of their walks. Fern Canyon, I'd say off the limits in the, off, off the list in, in the winter, off limits. The Osagon Trail, another one that's nice in the summer, but in the winter, it's very soggy down at the bottom and, and not one I would recommend. Something to, to keep in mind, however, as an alternative, between November and May, on the first Saturday of every month, Redwood National Park and State Parks, they close the Newton B. Drury Parkway, the, the old 101 that goes right through the heart of Redwood National Park. They close it to cars so that it's all pedestrian only, bicycles, walking. So that's first Saturday of every month, a, a great opportunity to go explore that area. Okay. There are, uh, some other things that I, I think are really wonderful to remember, and that's it. I'll talk a little bit about the state park effort to really improve ADA access on a number of their trails. So I'll highlight some of those that exist. One other thing about the state and, and national parks, um, both Humboldt Redwoods, Prairie Creek and Redwood National Park uh, are not dog friendly. They, they do not allow dogs. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, the Drury Cheney Walk down in Southern Humboldt, this is hike number 65 in your, your book, um, is a totally flat two plus miles. It is one of those that is ADA accessible. Now these are state park standards. So let me describe what that means. It means that they have a hard pack surface. Doesn't mean that they're paved. In some cases they are, but in some cases they are not. Um, there's minimal elevation gain or loss. They average a, le a level relatively benign 2% slope. Um, they have some and allow for some stretches maximum of 80 feet where it can exceed that. Um, the obstacles on the trail are not going to be any more than two inches high. And the width of the trail is 36 inches with regular passing spaces. So that is the state park definition of ADA standards. One thing to, to keep in mind after a storm, if there's a lot of downed trees or, or things, that there may be things that are exceeding the two inch high limit um, that have not been cleared yet. But uh, uh, in general, there's a real active effort to maintain these ADA accessible walks. One of the other great ADA, but also really nice walk um, in Redwood, National and state parks 
is from Big Tree up here in the, just north of Prairie Creek Redwoods Visitor Center, which is here. And going along Prairie Creek Trail is, it's all ADA uh, in their state standards of ADA accessible. They made it ADA accessible all the way around the Elk Prairie Trail and back on the Foothill Trail. So you could go quite a ways, more than four and a half miles on this ADA pathway. It, it's also a, a wonderful walk for those that aren't trying to push somebody in a wheelchair. Um, it's really delightful. Let me show you why again, um, especially along Prairie Creek, the Prairie Creek Trail and to some degree along this campground trail through the to the campground area, you get to see a lot of wonderful big leaf maples like this. It's surprising how much color there can be in the in the middle part of the fall. So that's something that also that is worth considering. So I already talked about the Big Tree Elk Prairie Loop, but I'm going to talk about two others, both of you, both of which use the um, Elk Meadows Visitor Center Day Use Area, which is off of Davidson Road. It has a nice parking area and bathroom right here. The uh, Strelo Creek Loop is one that I only recommend doing in the winter when the traffic is gone off of Davidson Road, which goes out to Fern Canyon. In the winter, there's very little traffic. In the summer, it's dusty, way too much traffic. Don't even think about this in the summer. But in the winter, there's about a five mile loop, six mile loop that goes Davidson Trail, follows Strelo Creek Trail up Strelo Creek. It can get a little soggy in this area, but it's not bad. And then takes the road back to Elk Meadows. And this all is quite flat. This has a, a big gain over the top of, on Davidson Road and back down to the uh, to Elk Meadows. The second alternative is the Trillium Falls Loop. The highlight of this area is uh, really not probably Trillium Falls. It's just a 10, 10 foot cascade. It's not bad, but it's but it's got some wonderful redwood growths and you can do a nice three mile rock also from, from the uh, uh, parking area for elk meadows. It's also a great place to see elk uh, in general. So this is one of the seven herds sort of concentrates in, in this area. The other thing I might mention about Davison Road is, and Davison Trail, Davison Trail not Davidson Road. Davidson Trail comes all the way from Prairie Creek Redwoods, comes down here, and it's an old haul road that was used when there was a, a lumber mill here at, at Elk Meadows Day Use Area. So it's hard packed road here. You'll see a picture of it in a moment. Goes and once you cross over 101, then this is actually all paved up here to Lost Man Creek. And this this area is also another good place to see these uh, big leaf maples as, as they turn. This is paved, again, it's, it's ADA accessible here. The Trillium Falls Trail is not ADA accessible, but, but the Davidson Trail is. So uh, something to, to keep in mind. All right, I'll, this is uh, the, Zach and Margie Zwirling with my wife, Amy. And this is the Davidson Trail behind us. As you can see, it's basically a, a road. Take a breath here. If anybody has a question, Kim, I don't know if I've, I've not been paying any attention. If there are questions, this would be a moment for me to take a drink and take there, a There um, is one question. Um, somebody is asking, are mountain bikes allowed on the um, Nature Center on the Malal trails? No. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. But dogs are, and there are some horse-friendly trails there. But no bikes. Yeah, and you know the big, another big issue has become uh, uh, electric bikes, and um, I think policies are sort of catching up with electric bikes now. And I, I'm not current on all of the places where elect, electric bikes are permitted and and not, but there has been more <coughs> uh, recognition of their um, them as a bit of a complicating factor because they uh, they are uh, becoming very, very common. Thank you, Kim. One more other quick question. Sure. Um, the first hike that you talked about around Maple Creek, 
Mm -hmm. What number was that in your book? It's not in the book. Oh, okay. um, so it's, it's a bonus. Oh, there you go. All right. Thanks. Here's another one that's actually not in my book. It's in Hiking Humboldt Volume 1. That's uh, Ken Burton's longer uh, day hikes. But this one actually is a six mile out and back, um, primarily on fire roads, basically in Bimbo State Rec Recreation Area. And um, it's obviously, for those of us that are living around Humboldt Bay, it's a long drive down there. So if for some reason you, you're feeling flush and you stay at Bimbo Inn for the weekend, um, a great walk, walk to consider doing or combine it with a road walk along the East Branch Road or go visit the Southern Humboldt Community Park, which uh, can be a little bit squishy just in terms of, uh, but it's a wonderful community park west of Garberville or um, take advantage of Richardson Grove and go down just a, another mile or so south of Benbo to, to walk in that area. Here's a map of the walk. Uh, in general, although Ken shows parking at the entrance to the Benbo Dam Road, I was up there just about a, a week and a half ago and it was gated off. So the parking may be in fact better closer to the Benbo Inn and the State Recreation Area parking area, which may mean you have to pay a fee. And then you walk the, the dam road and then fire roads. There is an area, and I haven't been on this section in a, in a while, so I'm a little unclear as to how severe the washout area is these days, but it was concerning. Um, and you continue on to the end of, this is, Camp Kentu, Kentu Road as it leaves from Garberville and Alice Avenue. There's a little community settlement here, number of houses, and that's where the road ends. You can actually do the walk from either direction. It's a little harder to find from the Alice Avenue side. And the, the, the Southern Humboldt Community Park is, is uh, on Camp Kentu Road. So, uh, and this gives you a little view of, of what the walking looks like. All right, number six. I did say that I was gonna include the Waterfront Trail North. Now, I'm including this because a couple of things have happened. One is that the gap between, uh, I think it's D and H, no, I'm not quite sure, F, F and G on First Avenue has been completed. So there's a nice way to both drive and walk safely on the one block stretch that previously separated the boardwalk from the, the Bay Trail. But my favorite part of it is basically going from around the Adorney Center, uh, past the Blue Ox, there's a 400 foot elevated walkway. If you haven't done it, I have a couple pictures to come. And all the way past Target underneath the uh, 101 bridge and over to the Open Door Clinic on Tid Street. It's a wonderful paved walk and uh, it gives you views like this, which are del just delightful. It also has a, a number of the artistic, commissioned artistic seats along the way. And this is one of my favorite. Now it looks a little faded, didn't look quite as bright as it did in this picture when it was first up. But uh, again, you can see another view of the walk that, uh, that this, and the views that this provides. Let's see, I don't, did I point out the, the 400 foot, I thought I had a picture, but I guess I don't. The 400 foot walkway is just on the, the bay side of, of um, the Blue Ox Millworks. So it's, it's a wonderful elevated walkway through wetlands. Okay, well, like I said, you're going to get more than 12. Some of the road walks that are definitely worth considering, um, three of these are down in the Ferndale area. Um, Pool Road, Williams Creek Road, and Crosby Road are all in the uh, Ferndale area. The Arcata Bottoms, obviously. Upper Fickle Hill Road is basically one of those that you go 
up to the very top of Fickle Hill, past sort of the, the last settlement. And uh, um, it's, it's mostly green diamond land and some pri other private lands on both sides, but the road walk is a, is a seldom trafficked part of Fickle Hill Road. And then this, this picture, which is the old state highway around the east side of Freshwater Lagoon um, is, is quite a delightful, unexpectedly del delightful walk. And it's a three mile out and back uh, along that road. It gets very little traffic. Um, everybody goes on 101 uh, along Freshwater uh, Lagoon on the west side. But this is uh, a quite a delightful old piece of roadway. One of the 1300 miles of roads in Humboldt County. You will see some notices like the one at the beginning of Pool Road, which are, are uh, a little bit ominous and unfriendly, but these are all county roads. So if you, you just need to pay some good attention to the, the um, realities of, of what it means to be a county road. So at a minimum, county roads have a 40 foot right of way from the, roughly the min, middle of the county road itself. So if you park, you need to take that into consideration. If you walk, stay on the, on the road itself. Um, often these are on open ranges. So I really advocate being a, a good citizen. Um, if you have a dog with you, make sure that the dog is leashed. Nothing aggravates farmers and ranchers more than to have a dog chasing their sheep or cows. And it, it ruins it for the rest of us later. And whenever I've been stopped, I just explain what I'm doing. And people have always been very, very friendly about it and very accommodating. These are good in winter because they're all passable. Hard packed, either hard packed gravel, like this is Pool Road from the upper area and you get a wonderful view out over the ocean and the, and the uh, Eel River. Um, it, there, many of them are, are paved as well. So that, that makes a, a easy walk. And again, a few more pictures. This is the pool road map. There's good parking down at the bottom. Um, and then the walk up, it's, it's uphill. Um, and you, you get a view uh, like I showed before and then this old ranch building, Upper Fickle Hill Road. This is a little taste of it. And then Williams Creek Road it's pretty delightful. Here's one on Crosby Road, which I, I should say Williams Creek is a nice gentle along Williams Creek for the first several miles and then it goes uphill. Crosby Road heads uphill pretty quickly and so it's a good aerobic workout, but it's it's a wonderful option and one that's not in, in the book, I, I should add. All right, number four, Humboldt Bay Wildlife Refuge. Um, again, no dogs on these, this option. The shorebird loop at the top um, is just a little less than two miles. Uh, it's basically open eight to five daily. Um, I'm not sure that the visitor center is currently open. Um, that's sort of been a COVID related reality. I'm not quite sure where, where they stand on that at this point. It is a great place to view as the winter proceeds towards spring to view the Aleutian cackling geese. Um, this is one of those amazing success stories that back in the 1960s, most of you probably know it, I have a, a view of it, of them here. Um, but they were down to a, a few hundred. Um, and then uh, actually a local wildlife biologist, Paul Springer, um, is credited with orchestrating their recovery. He concluded that there were four primary islands up in the Aleutians where these birds uh, bred. And he removed all the Arctic foxes from those, he arranged for the removal of all the Arctic foxes from those four islands. Those foxes had been put on there by furriers who had uh, made efforts to sort of use those as a, as confined space for them to raise these foxes. And basically it was, they were feeding on the Aleutian geese. Since that time, now they're tremendous number. And this is an old, 140,000 is an old number. There, there are abundant 
many more than that. They increase the numbers all the way until April when the fly-offs start to occur and they begin to re return to the Aleutians for the summer breeding season. The other good walk in this area is along Hookton Slough. And this also has historical elements to it because uh, this and Southport Landing, and actually I don't, in the summer during low, low minus tides, you can actually walk along this semi-sandy stretch of the uh, of Humboldt Bay, one of the only stretches on Humboldt Bay that is that that has any sand bottom and not a terribly muddy bottom. But in the winter, actually, I don't recommend it. But you can take the the levee all the way up here and back, which is about a three mile round trip. Um, and this used to be one of the primary ways that goods were agricultural goods prior to the advent of the. Uh, road that went from here to Eureka or the train that went so that we're talking in the uh, mid 1850s to 1870 time flat bottom flat bottom low draft boats were used to get goods from Hookton Slough to Eureka and and then on ships to San Francisco or elsewhere so it has a historical um, has a bit of history as well so it's 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 quite, both of them are quite fascinating hikes. And both of them, I should add, have uh, bathrooms available. This is a picture of me walking uh, along the, the South Shore, the sandy, somewhat sandy South Shore of, of Humboldt Bay on, min on a minus tide. And then the bottom picture is the old Henley House, which became Southport Landing. And there was a, a half mile long um, uh, wharf that went out from the Henley House out into to the bay so that that there also could be boats, shallow draft boats that would come in there. All right, number three, Fortuna's Riverwalk. Um, this is a great vantage point to watch the mighty eel in the winter when the rains do eventually come you start to appreciate the fact that the average flow of January and February of the eel is a hundred times what it is in August and September. I've been down there in September when there's actually no above rock, above the surface of the, uh, the bed of the river flow around Fortuna. But in the winter, the uh, flow is a hundred times what it is uh, in August and September. It carries the highest sediment load of any river of its size in the, U in the U.S. So it's for that reason that, that the fertile Eel River Delta exists. But the walk itself is, I, I recommend going and parking at River, river Lodge. Uh, and then uh, it's relatively easy walk, very flat along the level. It's all uh, compacted. Some paved down at this end and uh, hard packed on the, uh, the near, nearer end. Um, in the summer, you can walk down along the Van Dusen, but uh, once the rains come and the water's higher, this, this is not passable. It is also possible to squeeze in a walk going north from the River Lodge uh, and then make it a, a little bit of a loop on you follow the levee around and then come a road walk back. It's a shorter walk, but it's a, a nice variant to, uh, to the, the longer river walk. I mentioned too that Ferndale has an urban walk in the book. Let's see, uh, I should, let me take a moment and look that up because I think a lot of people tend to overlook Fortuna as a, uh, as a walking source. Riverwalk is hike number 63, but the architectural walk is hike number 64. And it's just a two and a half mile walk and um, surprisingly pleasant. Actually goes, goes from, uh, from the sort of area of the, the park there in uh, Rohnert Park in, in uh, central Fortuna and then primarily goes to the east. And this is another map 
I should note that is a, I've had to orient this way, but it north is to the to the left side of the of the screen. This is what it looks like uh, in drier times, clearly, and it's very dog friendly. I mentioned the loop going north. It's a one and a half, 1.7 mile loop going north. This is not a very long walk. Uh, it won't, it's one that tends to get forgotten off, oftentimes. It is also in hiking Humboldt. Um, it is a 1.1 mile paved walk from uh, the end of Elk River Road to the old site of the old mill town bulk. Uh, you see very little of what looks like this at this point, but it is a, a th there are signs along the way that give you a sense in, in the summer. I've talked about the west side or south side walk uh, along the way, but they've taken down out the, the summer bridges for that. Um, but it is a, a, an easy, delightful paved walk, very ADA accessible. If you have somebody as part of your household or family or friend group that is wheelchair dependent, this is a, a wonderful one to go on and good any, any time of the year. Okay, let's see. Um, this, this shows the, the map of that. The educational center hasn't been open that much later. Lately, it's about, um, Oh, halfway along the the one and a half mile, the one point one miles to Old Falk, the old mill shut down in the '30s. The last resident left in the early '60s. There was was a family that had a home here in the early part of the walk, and it's marked by two big yew trees that exist there. The the walk itself, if you're more ambitious, continues on for another four four miles past Old Falk that goes all the way up to the uh, the uh, headwaters forest and uh, um, that's a much more ambitious walk as it has quite a bit of elevation gain as well. It's dog friendly and let's see. Let's move to number one. The Blue Lake Industrial Park and Mad River Levee. Many people know this very popular dog walk, uh, but there's something going on. In, in the Blue Lake that I really want to highlight. I'm going to come back to the map. But the first section of the Annie and Mary Trail from Central Blue Lake is being completed as we speak. It's just a half mile long. Um, it, it goes along from downtown to the west. Um, it will be the first step in what will be, I hope, uh, roughly a six, six and a half mile trail between Blue Lake and, and Arcata. Uh, Arcata is well underway in the planning phase of a section that will go from the skate park, Larson Park, for three miles to the pump station number one. Um, that will be the next section of the Annie Mary Trail. Uh, in addition, Caltrans in conjunction with the city of the county of Humboldt is working on another stretch that will go to Glendale from from Blue Lake along Caltrans right of way adjacent to 299. So this is exciting stuff. The first half mile is uh, being completed, but there are some other good walks to be had that would take you to Blue Lake. A lot of people do the, the walk along the levee, which is what this picture shows. It's a easy 1.4 miles along the levee, but there's a, another one, 0.2 mile loop here that goes around the industrial park. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing, but it does get you out to the levee here. It's a fair distance away from the Mad River, but it's a, a nice additional loop and ties right into the, the, uh, the east side of that loop and the east side of Hatchery Road. Um, there is another option to sort of weave in here, and that is a, a new, relatively new pedestrian bridge. It goes across Powers Creek and goes back into Central Blue Lake. So between the Annie Mary Trail, between the, the Industrial Park Trail, between the Levee Trail, I think there are some nice ways to get a, a little bit more of an ambitious walk in and a chance to sort of experience all that Blue Lake has to offer.
there are other options. I, I talked about 2025 up to this point. Um, the Humboldt Botanical Garden is always great. I like it year round. They've really tried to work it so something is always in bloom. It has a couple of miles of, of walking options that are on either paved or hard packed walkway. So it's really not a bad option. They have more restrictive winter hours and the, there is a fee to get in. The Beast Creek Loop and the Sunny Brave Forest is another wonderful almost three mile walk. Um, it's a single track trail. It's one of my hesitations about giving it a hard recommendation. It, it's very uh, vigorous walk. It's, uh, it has a, a good aerobic component, but it's surprisingly beautiful to be almost in the heart of Sunny Bray and, and have this wonderful uh, forest walk. The South Fork of James Creek Loop is also similar to that, but on the north side of, of uh, the Arcata Community Forest. Both of these include parts of the Arcata Ridge Trail, which is uh, uh, still not complete, waiting for finalization of the crossing of Fickle Hill Road and then a, a small stretch of trail that will link it with uh, Sunny Brave Forest and the Fickle Hill Road. Uh, Potawat is also sort of a surprisingly nice walkway. It's, they have a small paved loop that's ADA accessible um, that's in the middle of their grounds. They have a wonderful garden area and uh, the grounds are, are surprisingly nat natural and they've really worked to sort of uh, reinvigorate a wetlands where they harvest native uh, plants for use in basketry and other traditional uh, native treatments. Um, let's see, even McKinleyville, the Midtown Trail loop, there's a loop in the book. It's not glamorous, but if you're looking for a an alternative to the Hammond um, or live somewhere down in, in the middle part of McKinleyville, um, you might consider it as just another option. And there are many, many more options that work on, on roads. But again, I try to avoid um, I've tried to avoid trails that are going to involve inland uh, high elevation walks. Wait till spring. Maybe I'll do another talk then about spring and, and summer walks or late spring and wildflowers. But I think uh, for now, avoid the high country and uh, focus on the ocean and, uh, and the coast and, and some of the, uh, the roads that we have to offer. All right, I, I'd be remiss. I will always want to do a plug about how do all these trails get maintained? Well, certainly uh, the city of Eureka, city of Arcata, Ferndale, Fortuna, County of Humboldt, all have staff that do yeoman work to maintain things, but there's never enough staff to do all of the, the work that's required. So there are volunteers that, that really make amazing contributions. I, in particular, want to plug the volunteer trail stewards um, we have work days most Saturday mornings, the first Sunday morning of, of, the, uh, of each month. The Wharf Trail has a 9 to 11 volunteer opportunity. The others are typically 9 to 11, sometimes 9 to 12 in the case of the Arcata Community Forest and Arcata uh, work sessions. But there are wonderful opportunities for anybody to come and whether it's pick up trash, uh, cut back vines, uh, blackberries, uh, fennel, other invasives. Um, there's so much that can be done. Graffiti removal, no special skills or abilities are required. The way to, to sort of hook in is through the website www.humtrails.org. That's www.humtrails.org. So, uh, we're at one o'clock. I know some had to leave then, but I'm hoping there's still some questions. I'm happy to talk about anything more at this point, aside from my sex life. <laughs> um, Reese, on the, the um, slide that you had with the river and, and you, where you were listing all the other um, trails, Yes. Um, somebody was mentioning that that looked like a good swimming hole and wondered where, where it is. All right, this, this one in particular. Uh, it is a good 
potential swimming hole in the summer. Um, it is just off of, of Avenue of the Giants is where it's taken and it's called Big Rock. I have the hike in here. I don't remember the number. Let me find it. The one caveat to it is that uh, once the rain start, don't even think about it. Um, it's called High Rock. It's high, high 66. And uh, the other caveat I would say is that uh, if you're allergic to poison oak, there's lots of poison oak in, in this particular area. So you have to be pretty cautious getting down to the, to the river. But it's part of a good walk and uh, it's a great view from High Rock itself. Um, John Tab asks, how is the project going for the new pathway from Arcata to Eureka? Oh, that's a great question. Well, um, the County of Humboldt is primarily responsible for that. Hank Seaman has taken the lead. They have just recently finished what they call the 60% mark in terms of the planning. And that allows them to begin the process of pursuing the, the many and various permits that are required to, to get final approval for the, uh, for the Arcata to Eureka, the Bay Trail. Um, so, what Hank has said at this point is that he is still hopeful uh, that we will begin to break, that we will be able to break ground sometime in 2021. I personally wouldn't be surprised to see that slide in 2022, but the money exists for it. Uh, I think one of the big things that they're working on now, in addition to the permitting, is securing a right of way from the a couple of private landowners that, that exist along that area. That's, that's a great question and glad you asked. So another part of that that I might plug is that um, we have been working on the Humboldt Bay Tra Trail Fund, which is an endowment fund, primarily an endowment fund that will be used to support the volunteer, primarily volunteer trail efforts, trail maintenance efforts uh, along the Bay Trail once it's completed will also be able to be available for emergency repair and those kinds of things. And we've got about almost $400,000 in that fund, but our goal is to at least get to half a million because we're just using the interest earnings from that. So um, that's donations could be made through the Humboldt Area Foundation for that, that endeavor. Um, Stephanie Parrott made a comment, I think when you were talking about the Humble Wildlife Refuge, the National Wildlife Refuge, um, and she said that the, um, the visitor center was closed when she was there recently. Okay, yeah, I, I thought so. They, the visitor centers, most, most places have been closed uh, throughout the COVID-19 with no, no intent, I think, to open until there's a, a, a better way to socially distance and keep everybody safe. And then I just have to I just have to put this out here. Um, Wendy Robertson pointed out that she um, she was chased by an aggressive bull on Mountain View Road recently up in Neyland, and she had to get to a fenced area. So just a little um, open range warning. A bull. It's yeah. it's uh, it's usual. Wow. I'm I'm sorry for Wendy. That that's a little too exciting. Yeah, um, a little scary. <laughs> I, I will say that for the most part, unless they're breeding. Uh, the ranchers are not going to keep bulls in these pastures uh, in the open range. They they are mostly heifers and steers and not bulls. So um, that I, I have spent a lot of hours on these open ranges and I never have never actually seen a bull that's not been in a fenced area. So I, I'm sorry for Wendy, but uh, that, that's a pretty rare occurrence. Good reason to take walking sticks, however. <laughs> I'm trying to um, jump ahead. Let's see. Lots of big thank yous. Um, let's see. Oh, Amazon Smile. You can do fun. You can get a. Uh, you can um, get money that way as well. The fundraising if you for the trail stores when you buy things on Amazon. That's Great. another way. Great. Um, and most of these are just thank yous and also there was earlier one where somebody was thanking that um, you because they hadn't even thought about walking on the roads. So that is, um, that was a great tip. 
I, I, I really uh, want to make a shameless plug for Hiking Humble Volume 2. And I, it's not quite as shameless as, as it might seem because all of the proceeds that I earn from this book uh, are donated to the Humboldt Bay Trail Fund, which has been nearly $3,000 at this point. Um, so not an insignificant amount. Um, but I certainly would, uh, they are available. Um, I, I have a small supply, so through me, but also at a number of the local bookstores, which I really want to plug, Eureka Books. Um, actually, I don't even know where they're all. They used to be at the co-op, uh, Northtown Books. Um, I don't even, I, I'm going to get in trouble trying to list them all um, because I don't know them all. But um, I, I would appreciate it and thank you if you consider buying one. So. Well, a lot, lot of people saying thank you. And then um, MJ noted that the visitor center is open at Prairie Creek State Park. Good, good. So that is good to know. All right. Well, without any further ado. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions? There was a question about walking groups. Oh, oh. I did. I did respond to the um, to that one privately. Yeah. Um, Lynn was asking about the Fortuna walking group. And so sure. I, I might mention a couple of the ones that I'm aware of. Um, however, at this COVID time, I think um, most of the walking groups that I'm aware of have sort of restricted their membership and, and numbers. So the Fortuna Senior Hiking Group hikes every Friday morning. Uh, and they go different locations. Um, but I think at this point, they are trying to limit the the membership to uh, the people, they have over 120 people on their list. So I think they're trying to keep the, the numbers down. Um, the Ramblers, the Geezers, two other walking groups, I think are doing the same unless, I'm guessing there may be somebody listening in unless they've left who are members of that, those two groups and, and may be able to speak to that. The Sierra Club does has had public walks. I'm not sure exactly what, what's happening uh, with regard to them. Anybody else have questions? Oh, oh John, you have a question? You can unmute yourself. Let's unmute you. There you go. No, you're still muted. Okay. okay. Hey, Reese. John, how are you? Great presentation. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. Um, even though I'm not from Humboldt, you know, the few times we visited you down there, uh, you, I, I recognize a lot of these places because you quickly get us out on. <laughs> Come again. You can tell you can, yeah. Anyway, I had a question, and this is a question that everybody knows from your area. But the trail that we walked on through the Redwoods was, I think it took off from sort of that elk area. Uh -huh. uh, and they had those, tr the Redwoods had those huge uh, open pits underneath them that were called like goose something or another. The goose pins. Goose pins. Yeah, the, go okay, the goose pins where the Redwoods have experienced fire in the past. Um, and they end up with a, a burned out core. And back in the day, those were easy ways for, for uh, settlers to uh, put their livestock in that at nighttime and okay. fence off yeah. the, the edge of it. So they became goose pens. That was a highlight of, <laughs> one of the highlights of the trail that we went on that I always remembered. I couldn't remember the... Uh, <clears throat> The story behind those. <laughs> I, I might mention one other thing about the redwoods and fires. Uh, I just actually went with my older daughter to Santa Cruz and we took a, a after their fires unfortunately and we went through Henry Cowell State Park which had experienced quite a severe burn but it was comforting in many ways to see the big old redwoods because while burned at the bottom, the thick, thick redwood bark um, had prevented them from dying. 
And so the redwoods were still alive and uh, will live to see many more years as a result. So when we go through the Arcata Community Forest or Redwood National Park, Park and we see these trees with burn marks on them that have come from some ancient time, um, the good news is that the redwoods are really well prepared, especially the old growth redwoods are well prepared to survive. And uh, mm -hmm. while the undergrowth and the smaller trees die and are burned, the redwoods persist. And that, that was very comforting 